Welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. COVID-19 continues to spread across the country, and some of the highest numbers over the last few weeks are coming in from non-metropolitan counties. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight we're going to open up our phone lines and give you a chance to talk to the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. You're a big part of this show. Join the conversation tonight. Again, that number is 877-731-6733. And joining us live tonight from Omaha, Nebraska, is University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And we also welcome the Chief of Pathology and Microbiology at UNMC, Dr. Steve Henricks. Thanks so much for joining us, gentlemen. Dr. Gold, let's nice start with an overview of the number of COVID-19 cases in rural America. So, Christina, I usually like to start out with some of the really good news and talk about these trends. But unfortunately, tonight, the trends that we've been seeing are concerning uh, to many across our country, both in rural and in urban uh, America. So if we look at some of the global trends, and let's start off with some of the graphics, uh, we see that we've exceeded uh, 10 million uh, confirmed cases worldwide with over 500,000 deaths. And what our public health people tell us is that these numbers are off by at least a factor of 10. So that would mean that worldwide there are over 100 million individuals that actually have had this viral infection and many, many more deaths than the half a million that we're seeing here. Now when we shift to the numbers that look at our nation, that look at the cases across the United States, what we see is that a good quarter of the worldwide cases, two and a half million people, are confirmed to have been infected here in the United States with about 125,000, almost 126,000 deaths as of this afternoon. That means that we're still seeing about a 5% fatality rate in the United States and we're still seeing between a 12 and a 14% hospitalization rate in the United States. And when we start to look at some of the differences and similarities between the rural and urban communities, what we see is that while the cases and the deaths and the hospitalizations continue to go up in the urban communities, they're also continuing to rise in our farming and ranching communities, which is, of course, an area of concern. Because for a very long time, those large urban communities, think New York, L.A., Detroit, uh, New Orleans, etc., really led the country in the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, and the number of deaths. But over time, that's continued to spread more homogeneously across the United States, which has produced cases, hospitalizations, and tragically loss of life in our farming and in our ranching communities as well. And so while there is good news, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about testing and viral therapy, and hopefully we'll even get a chance uh, to talk about vaccine development, which is good news, uh, the number of cases is concerning. This particular graphic looks at uh, the state of Tennessee, for instance, which, of course, is a combined rural and urban state, one of the many states in the country, uh, one of the nearly 30 states in the country, which is seeing significant case number rise uh, currently, just over 40,000 cases and just over 580 tragically loss of life uh, in Tennessee. Certainly not the only state, but an example of what's happening now widely across the U.S. Wow. And, you know, testing has been such a key part of the equation. We know that it's really been ramping up. And Dr. Goldboy, did you bring us the guest to tell us all about testing, accuracy, where it's headed? Dr. Henricks, tell us a little bit about your background and the type of questions you're going to be able to help our viewers out with tonight. Thank you, Christina. So I'm a pathologist and I started my career in North Dakota. And I've been all over the country ever since, uh, moving from North Dakota then to uh, California, and then on to uh, Washington and the National Institutes of Health where I did my fellowship in molecular biology. Uh, later, moving uh, to the Midwest and developing a laboratory in uh, virology interest there. I would say the most significant uh, uh, component of my background is when we developed the public health laboratory at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And that has really opened up the field in both our work in virology and in virology research. 
Absolutely, and boy has it positioned you right now to give us so much important information. It's so critical to have you right where you are right now, and we get to tap into your knowledge tonight, so we're looking forward to it. Let's get that started. Jack of West Virginia says, although the number of cases are climbing, there's less spread in nursing homes and at meatpacking plants. What's the biggest contributor to controlling the virus in tight quarters? Yeah, Jack, you know, uh, your observation is correct. And I think that our meatpacking facilities across the United States, I think our senior citizen facilities, our long-term care facilities, et cetera, across the country have gotten the message that all of the non-pharmacologic interventions until we have safe and effective vaccines available uh, are critically important. So whether it's social distancing, use of personal protective equipment, testing, testing, and more testing. And we're going to talk a lot more about one of the world with one of the world's experts here on testing. Uh, all of those things have added in to a lot more safety in the plants. But you know, I would say of all of those non-pharmacologic interventions, perhaps the one that I like to reflect on the most is education. And by that, I mean, through multilingual sources, uh, we've been able to educate not just the leaders of these large companies, that own the meatpacking plants and the long-term care facilities, but the line workers as well, so that they understand about what safety is and protection when they're at work, and very importantly, when they go home to be with their loved ones and their family members so they can protect themselves and protect their communities. So a lot of moving parts, Jack, but it's been well worth it, and it's had a really, really good effect across the U.S. You know, historically, until about uh, four weeks ago, the overwhelming majority of new cases and of hospitalization came out of meatpacking facilities, long-term care facilities, senior citizen facilities, and that has now changed so that the no largest number of new cases that we're seeing across the United States is actually in younger populations uh, and, again, much in need of education. All right. Thank you, Jack, for that question. It was a good one. Our next question comes from a caller in northern Florida. Curious about symptoms. Let's listen. What are the odd things that the doctors have noticed um, in regard to the virus uh, when a person has never had a fever, um, but when they test, they do have the virus? Any odd um, red flags that would come up? Well, you know, that's one of the unique features or relatively unique features of this particular infection in that there's a long period, it appears, that individuals can have the virus and be able to infect other people. And please notice that Dr. Hendricks and I are sitting more than six feet apart tonight or we'd be wearing masks and protecting ourselves. But that people can carry live virus and transmit it to other people for a significant period of time before they themselves become symptomatic or before they may not even become symptomatic and carry the virus. And we've seen a good number of young people. There was, you know, a number of reports uh, recently from the United States Navy uh, from the Theodore Roosevelt aircraft carrier that demonstrated that a significant number of United States military on board the carrier uh, actually tested positive for the virus and never had a single symptom. You know, Dr. Hendricks, in your experience, I mean, how rare is that? Is, is that surprising uh, that this virus is so uh, different in that way, or is this unique to this class of viruses? Well, I think, in fact, it's very similar to what we've been seeing with other coronaviruses, and we have at least uh, three or four of those circulating in, in our communities now. Um, and in addition, I think one of the most unusual factors or features of this virus related to the question is the loss of taste and smell. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting and very unusual. There are some Coxsackie viruses that do that. In fact, when I first heard it, I said, well, they must be talking about the wrong virus. But it's been seen over and over again that individuals who are infected lose their sense of taste and their, t and their sense of smell. The good news is they recover it, is what I'm told. It's true. Yeah, it's sad interesting. to go through life without your sense of smell. <laughs> COVID toes is another interesting phenomenon that we've heard about, sores on toes. So we've heard about all kinds of very interesting symptoms. But let's talk a little bit more about the actual 
testing. Marilyn of California says, we live in a rural town north of Fresno, and my daughter and son were both tested for COVID-19. My daughter got her results back in two days, but my son had to wait over a week. Why such a difference? Well, that's a very important issue, and it all depends on a number of important factors. The first issue is, was the testing done uh, easily, and did the result, was it clear cut? If the result is clear cut, that means they'll usually release the information right away. But if the individual had, an, had a test that was on the borderline, and the company wanted to go back and look at it a couple more times, that could definitely delay the situation and delay the result that was eventually reported. Okay. Other factors, Steve, that might delay it? There are, and I'd like to bring up that as a, another important question. So if the testing is done locally, so the specimen was collected and then, say, driven across town, that can definitely uh, limit or reduce the amount of time it takes to get the result. But if the sample had to be uh, flown across the country or driven to an, a distant laboratory, then that obviously is going to take another day, another two days. And then the last feature or the last issue is how does the result get back to the individual? Was it by a phone call from the office where it was collected or perhaps an email or unfortunately maybe a letter? And of course you can imagine then that that's going to delay the result. Okay. Let's unpack a little bit more how important the two of you are, because I think that our audience really needs to know. Dr. Gold, UNMC developed a COVID-19 test through the Nebraska Public Health Lab. Describe what that process was like, developing a test with a novel virus moving in. You had pressure, you had urgency, you were up against the clock. What was that like? Well, you know, uh, we had the opportunity uh, much earlier this year, back in February, uh, to actually host a group of individuals from Wuhan, China. These were all American citizens and their family. And shortly thereafter, as this was continuing to evolve, we were asked to accept a number of American citizens who were on the Diamond Princess cruise line that was moored in Yokohama, Japan at that time. And so that was a, a real wake-up call to our Department of Pathology to think about what we could do to develop reliable testing, because not only for these individuals who might need it to answer the question of, okay, if somebody is infected uh, with COVID, when could we safely send them home? Uh, could they visit with their family members and things of that nature? And similarly, we had a pretty good understanding, and we asked Dr. Henriks in a second, that this was not going to be limited to 18 or 20 or 50 people off the Diamond Princess, but that likely we were going to see cases across the United States. And so, uh, so, Steve, how does one go about developing a test of this nature? Well, what's really interesting is that a test today started five years ago when you recruited the right people to work with you and the outstanding scientists that we have in our department. So fortunately, after receiving the information about needing to develop a test, we went to our own experts and said, let's get started, what's it going to take? I think most people will be very interested to know that, in fact, it's a recipe uh, because what you do today is based on a recipe that you look up in the literature and you see how other people developed other assays to similar organisms. And then you go and look at the genetic information about the virus. And fortunately, that had already been collected and we were able to look at the genetic information about the virus and then put together all the pieces that are critical in a laboratory to get the result. Uh, as you probably have read and heard, there's a number of reagents, meaning chemicals, uh, that are required. There's instrumentation that's required. There's controls. Uh, but last and most important, again, it's the people. It's the people in the laboratory that do the work that is critical. So we've got some rock stars in the lab, right, we that, absolutely uh, that do. do this work, which is uh, absolutely fascinating. And I'm looking at two of their leaders right now. I love getting a chance to ask you these questions because now not only do we have a test that tells you whether or not you have the virus, we've gone on to develop additional tests as well. Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so let me do some uh, introduction uh, to this. So there are approximately <clears throat> three different categories of tests that are useful to talk about uh, as it relates. The PCR testing, uh, or the molecular test, uh, is the oldest, and that's the one that's most commonly reported in the literature. 
So when people ask the question, how many cases are there, they're almost invariably uh, uh, reporting molecular tests. But there are two other types of tests that people have become interested in. One is the blood test or the antibody test, sometimes called the serologic test, and the other is the antigen test. So maybe, Steve, you can talk to our audience a little bit about the similarities and the differences, how you obtain the specimens, what different types of laboratories are necessary, maybe a little bit about what the turnaround time is, and then the, you know, what people should expect from the use of these different tests, meaning how is it helpful? Yeah, I'd be happy to. As you can imagine, uh, this is a, as exciting to me to talk about uh, tests as other people like to talk about cars. So in terms of the molecular test, that's the one I described first that uses a genetic material of the virus. And now most people are reading in the newspaper about these antibody tests when basically what we're doing is collecting from the blood of the individual uh, the ability to determine whether that blood is carrying an antibody. That's the antibody test. And then uh, lastly, if people are going to their physician's office and they're saying, we have a rapid uh, in-house test or in-clinic in, uh, test that we can do for you, that's most likely an antigen. And what they're detecting is a small fragment of the virus uh, that can be put into a, a small test tube and get a very rapid answer. However, the, uh, th that is probably the least accurate of the assays. It's also the least sensitive. So uh, in order, we would say the molecular test is one of the most important because it establishes that the molecular material is there of the virus. And then the antibody test measures whether or not you've responded to a viral infection. And that takes some time to develop, as I understand, Steve, that while the uh, molecular test may be positive, long before you even develop your first symptom. It takes days, maybe even as much as a week, to start to develop antibodies, is that right? Yeah, so back to the beginning. So the, the, the amount of time it takes for an individual to develop a, an antibody varies, but it's, it can happen in three, five, eight days, almost always by eight to 10 days. Um, but then the ability to test it in the laboratory also differs. There are some formats that are very fast. You can get an answer within a, a very short period of time. But other formats uh, where you want to be able to study it in detail, and that could take, again, a, a overnight, uh, a, a possibly even a second day. Okay. So this isn't like we were talking about earlier, Dr. Gold and I, on a previous show about potentially making it like a pregnancy test, and so you'd get an answer, yes or no, but in many cases, you actually have doctors who have to go in and actually look at an actual lab sample to get a better picture of what's happening. That is interesting. I didn't know that was part of the story. Also, we want to talk a little bit more about drug therapies. We know that you've been doing a lot of research on remdesivir, so we're going to talk about that when we come back. We'll also talk about the latest when it comes to vaccines. So we have a lot to cover tonight. We're just getting started, and our phone lines are open. We'd love to hear from you. It's time to take your calls, 877-731-6733. That's the number more rural health matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center talking vaccines and drug therapies on the other side of this break. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold. And we are also joined by Dr. Heinrich tonight. So we have a lot to talk about. Let's talk about what you're learning in regards to treating or preventing the virus. We want to know about progress with drug therapies and vaccine development. So why don't we start talking about therapies first, because I think that they're going to be first uh, before we're going to get to uh, effective and safe vaccines. Uh, so as we've talked about on this show previously, uh, uh, we've done a lot of the research on the Rendesivir drug, which is the Gilead product. Uh, it's an antiviral agent that was first developed for uh, things such as dengue fever and Ebola and actually HIV going back to its... Uh, its uh, early origins, and it's turned out through uh, one of the uh, early trials that was actually stopped because of its success, that it does have a significant shortening of hospitalization for seriously ill individuals who are treated with remdesivir compared to those that are controlled and, uh, and got placebo. And there was a significant trend, although not a statistically significant difference, as we say, but a important trend in survival favoring the remdesivir patients. 
So that's resulted in a number of other uses of remdesivir across the United States, one of which is a combination trial that's actually going on right now with remdesivir and an anti-inflammatory agent. But I understand there'll be some preliminary results in another week or 10 days. And so in a future show, we'll hopefully break that news to the audience. But there's also some interesting work going on with remdesivir right now as a preventative agent in patients that have very mild symptoms, but are in a risky age group, have comorbidities, have other factors that would think that they might be at higher risk for hospitalization or ending up in an intensive care unit or on a ventilator. And so remdesivir, while certainly not a cure-all, certainly has demonstrated the fact that it does have an impact, and it gives us a clue as to ways that we can start to blunt the death toll and the hospitalization of the virus. Now, there was recently a very large study that was released that showed that a widely available steroid known as dexamethasone uh, has been tried in relatively small doses, just a couple of milligrams, that demonstrated that in very sick patients, it also shortened hospitalization and had a significant survival impact. Now, that has not been shown in what's in a so-called prospective randomized trial, but it certainly makes the point that a lot of inflammatory action does occur in the human body that perpetuates and makes more severe some of the impact of this viral infection. And we shouldn't be surprised by that because that's how our body fights bacteria and viruses uh, and others. A lot of work also being done now in a very interesting level in so-called monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies. So these are antibodies that are not being naturally made by people, but, you know, think convalescent serum. We've talked about that. That serum taken from the blood of individuals who were previously infected built their own antibody system, and then it's purified and then given to people uh, who have been infected who are quite seriously ill. And again, not conclusive, but some preliminary data on what's going on in the ability to blunt the severity and the duration of the infection. Now, the vaccine story is quite different. I'm going to ask Dr. Hendricks to tell us a little bit about what some of the good news is on the vaccine development front and how our audience needs to better understand that. Probably the most significant news in regards to vaccines is how many companies are investing and putting their time and effort into it. Um, it really does mean that we are fairly confident that there is going to be a successful vaccine. Uh, and the preliminary studies are verifying that, meaning studies in animals are showing uh, good evidence of, uh, of protection. Again, the number of companies that are putting their time into it definitely indicates that there is going to be a group or a number of vaccines that are going to be successful. What we don't know yet is just how many of those vaccines are going to uh, make it through the pipeline that you see here. Um, because it takes a lot of uh, different efforts in order to get to the final end. But the other second question is, how long will the antibodies last or the immune uh, system's protection last? And that's still a question we don't know. I love the transparency, though, that you're always able to tell us that, that you don't have all the answers right now. I was even talking to Dr. Gold about it. I said, you know, do you learn anything new about this virus? And what did you say, Dr. Gold? I learn something new every day. Uh, that's the one thing that, that doesn't surprise me, is that I am surprised by something I either read or learn every single day. But I am optimistic about the vaccine production. And as Dr. Henrik says, uh, I think we're going to have a number of vaccines, not just one, that's going to be available in the early winter months or possibly around the holidays, is what I'm thinking. And, you know, I, I think it's worthwhile for the audience to understand, one, is that there's going to be more than one vaccine. I think what's going to be used for children is likely going to be different than what we're going to be using for our senior citizens and for those uh, with comorbidities, just like for the flu. And I think also it shouldn't uh, be a surprise to anybody that it's going to take more than one dose of the vaccine to get to where we want to be. You know, just like we currently in some of our uh, older citizens we boost the flu vaccine twice a year, usually once in the fall and once in the uh, you know, mid to late winter months. And, uh, and that's to get the maximum response to the vaccine. You know, I, I shouldn't be a secret to anybody that as you start to get older, 
that your ability to mount antibodies gets less and less and that it takes more uh, to develop uh, active immunity. And so therefore, a different vaccine, uh, you know, whether it's for the flu or whether it's for COVID-19 and possibly a second dose. And this, uh, Christine, is also a good time for me to remind the audience that as soon as the flu vaccines come out, particularly for our senior citizens, this is a really good time uh, to get your flu shots because we're not going to want to confuse COVID with influenza this year. I mean, it's never a good idea to have influenza. It always causes hospitalization. It always causes ventilator dependence. It always causes deaths every year, particularly in the most vulnerable senior citizens. But this year, if we confuse it with COVID until we can have two separate vaccines, it's really important to go out and get that vaccine. And it's almost certainly going to be available shortly after Labor Day. So when we celebrate the Labor Day holidays together, and by the way, we're going to celebrate that with good social distancing, wearing your masks and other such things. First thing to think about after Labor Day is, when can I get my flu shot? <laughs> and hey, you got to keep in mind, Independence Day is this weekend. And so it's another opportunity to remind people, as Dr. Gold always does such a good job of, just to stay safe right now. And when you talk about the potential for a vaccine, late winter months, Sounds good to me. Our next caller is Denise from New Mexico, and she is going to stay in this vein of vaccines. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm wondering just really how accurate do you think the antibody test is? I had one that was similar to the pregnancy test, and it showed that I was negative to the COVID virus. But back in February, I'd been very sick, and I was pretty sure that it sounded like all of the COVID symptoms that I had. Yeah, Denise, you know, why don't I start and I'll hand it over to Dr. Henricks. Uh, you know, we've learned in Dr. Henricks' laboratories uh, and many others that there's just like any test, there's some variability and there's a good deal of variability in these antibody tests. We've also learned that there are multiple different antibodies that can be tested for. So, Steve, you know, what would be your advice for Denise in terms of whether she should be retested and why is there so much variability? Uh, we've been able to look at at least four, if not five, different testing platforms, uh, one of which along, along the lines of what Christina was uh, mentioning, that is like a, like a pregnancy test. And there's huge variability in the accuracy of those assays. Um, in fact, some of them are no better than a coin toss, 50% uh, accurate. Uh, others differ because of the scientific background and considerations that went into the test. Uh, most people don't realize that the virus actually has multiple different components, and you may or may not make an antibody to all those different components. So in fact, the test may be correct, but it didn't ask the right question. So uh, right now what we're looking at is how many of those components of the viruses, what you see here as in those little orange blocks, um, there are other components of the, of the virus. And if you, your test only has those components, you could be falsely negative. And unfortunately, even with some of the best commercial assays out there, we're seeing as much as a 10 to 20% false negative rate. So actually, the real question is, uh, do you have access to other assays or tests in your community? Or should you just wait to see now when we have an, another couple assays that are out there and whether uh, you should have those tests? So my guess is, Right now, it doesn't matter uh, to you, but it, when we have the vaccine, it will matter, and that's when we think we're going to have the best tests that are available. And that continues to evolve, right, Steve? You know, Absolutely. Uh, if you think about it, when the first uh, antibody test came out, there was a very wide variability uh, of those that were emergency use authorization certified. And over time, that's gotten narrower and narrower as the tests have gotten more and more accurate. And so, Denise, I, I guess uh, if you really have to know, you could be retested. I would not recommend a point-of-care test. Would you agree with that, Steve? Yes, and by a point-of-care test, meaning one of those uh, small um, pregnancy-type assays. Uh, we really think that it would be better if you then uh, either went to your physician and told them you already had one negative and that maybe you were thinking that you should be tested again, and if they were convinced... They may send your specimen off to a reference laboratory, one of the national laboratories, where they would have another uh, test that they could use. But as I said before, 
you maybe really don't need to know today, but when we have the vaccine, that's when you're going to really want to know. You know, that's where I would just uh, reinforce, Denise, that what's the purpose of knowing? Because you're probably not going to do anything different because we're going to recommend, I'm going to recommend to you that you take all the usual precautions, whether you have antibodies or not. And that we, because we really don't know whether the antibodies are active and whether they prevent you from getting reinfected. And even more importantly than that, whether they prevent you from carrying the virus asymptomatically and, and giving it to somebody else. Those so, are essential points, Dr. Gold. I can't uh, emphasize them enough, meaning uh, we don't really know what the antibody means or which antibody. So at this point, still protect yourself with a mask, still use social distancing. Uh, that's what's important until we have a vaccine or we actually uh, obtain herd immunity throughout the country. Okay, so if you get that antibody test back, it says you did recover from COVID-19. It is not a ticket to ride. We still need to treat the situation as we did before. Okay. It is not a ticket to ride, Christina. Thank you for clarifying that. Our next question comes from Melissa in Arkansas. Let's listen. And I just wanted to know, when we get past all this crazy COVID-19 silliness, what are the chances of us getting another disease to humans in the next five to 10 years? Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, COVID, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. It falls into a category of what we call zoonotic viruses. And by that, I mean, uh, these are viruses that live in remote parts of the world, this particular one is thought to have started in a bat cave in China, you know, similarly to what's happened with Ebola and, you know, other viruses of this nature. And I, I think, I believe, and we'll ask the expert here in a minute, but I believe that it's inevitable that we'll continue to see some of these zoonotic viruses sort of pop out and mutate so that they can infect human beings. And hopefully we'll continue to learn from the COVID uh, pandemic of better ways to protect and stop the spread, faster ways to develop vaccines and antivirals so that we're better prepared from both a public health perspective and from a medical perspective to deal with this. But uh, what do you think, Steve? Uh, likely, unlikely? Well, I would go even further than that and say, um, I think it's uh, a guaranteed situation that it's going to happen again. Uh, humans sometime in our past history have ha had exposure to at least three or four other coronaviruses, meaning this exact situation happened before. Uh, it's just that maybe it happened before we had written history. Uh, so it will happen again. And we, we actually in the past thought it was much more likely that we'd have a situation like this with influenza. So we've been preparing for outbreaks of influenza, pandemics is what we call them. Um, there's no doubt there will be a pandemic of influenza, but I also believe with the increased globalization, the increased focus on obtaining higher protein and hunting uh, in areas that weren't hunted before, we will see another virus like this again. Wow. Well, I'd like to say that brings us a little bit of relief, but at least we know that the gentleman researching everything that comes in, and when it comes to pathology, we know that we have the best in the business, and we are so grateful for our connection to you. That does raise some concerns, though, and you look at how other countries operate, say in China, they've been wearing masks for the past 10, 20 years in many cases. Is that something that we're going to start to adapt more to here at home? You know, I think we are, Christina. And I think it's going to be independent of what public policy is. Uh, you know, I talk to a lot of citizens in our community here and as I travel, uh, and, uh, and they're afraid. Uh, you know, they're afraid not only of that they might get the virus, uh, but they're afraid that their loved ones, their parents, their grandparents, that they want to spend, let's talk about the Fourth of July holidays for a minute, you know, that's typically a time to get outdoors, to get with your family, to have barbecues and go to events and fireworks and things of that nature. And we can't tell people not to do it, and I don't think we really want to. But what the message needs to be, if you're going to do it, do it safely. Uh, you know, take care of social distancing. If you're going to set up, uh, you know, a blanket out on the grass and, and watch the fireworks or be with your family, just stay with your tightly knit family that you live with and, uh, and don't get into anything more 
uh, anything less than a six foot social distancing, please wear your mask. And that protects you and protects others. You know, early on, the data, the science about mask wearing was, was less sure than it is today. Uh, and I'll tell you that I won't go out into public, whether it's to the grocery store or to the pharmacy or even for a walk in the park uh, without wearing my mask, even though I'm with friends uh, and others. And I actually got my mask right here. And I like to, to express my old brand loyalty. You know, uh, it's our <laughs> Med Center brand. And, uh, and I'm seeing here uh, uh, Mr. Gotch just joined us in the studio, and he's wearing his mask and looking pretty darn good. So, uh, uh, you know, if, uh, if uh, our president and CEO can wear a mask, if Dr. Hendricks and I wear a mask, you know, it's a really small thing to ask people to do. And as you said, uh, other parts of the world, uh, particularly in the Far East, have been wearing their masks routinely for years, decades. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and if this becomes the new normal, I would say that's a small price to pay. Absolutely. Health, it's everything. All right, we are going to pause for a quick break, but our phone lines are open, and we'd love to hear from you. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, University of Nebraska Medical Center Chancellor, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold. We also welcome the Chief of Pathology and Microbiology at UNMC, Dr. Steve Henricks. Thank you for joining us once again. Our next question comes from the Peach State. Eloise of Georgia has a question about a technique for cleaning masks. Let's listen. A friend of mine told me that a doctor told her that you, how you could sanitize those uh, cloth masks was put them in a brown paper sack and put them uh, like on, up on your dash or somewhere where the warm, hot sun could, and said that would sterilize them. Yeah, Eloise, you know, uh, there's a lot been written about reusing masks and cleaning masks. I don't know if I'd quite call it sterilizing them, but certainly <clears throat> for the cloth masks, you want to wash them in warm water or hot water, and then you want to put them in a dry cycle because the combination of the washing and the heat drying definitely is badness for this virus, and it's going to render it, uh, <clears throat> hopefully kill most of the virus particles. There's been a lot of uh, work on ultraviolet light, uh, to kill the virus particles, which it seems to be sensitive to. And then even drying in the sunlight is somewhat effective. But how effective is the sunlight, Steve? Do you think it's something that we want to recommend to just to put your mask out there on the table and, uh, and, and let the sun beat down on it during the day? Well, um, we call that sanitization, and I think there is some value to that. It's really the issue of drying it out so that none of the viruses uh, can still survive. And the other point we want to emphasize is uh, if we're going to sanitize and or wash a mask, make sure it is a cloth mask and not the fabric uh, synthesized masks uh, that are also being used uh, regularly. Those are meant to be disposed and they should not be uh, sanitized in any way. And, you know, I think it's a good advice for our audience that, you know, when you're wearing a mask, particularly if you're wearing it all day long, uh, it's pretty obvious it does get moist inside from the humidity in your breath. And that's really when it's a good time to think about changing it and letting the mask dry out. And so uh, each of us has a different amount of humidity in our breath, depending on how much we're talking. <clears throat> so for instance, if I was wearing a mask uh, during this show, it probably wouldn't take me more than 20, 30 minutes to get the mask pretty moist from uh, all of the talking that I'm getting to do tonight. And by the way, thanks for the opportunity to do that. <laughs> Whereas if I was just sitting watching uh, TV or reading a book quietly to myself, uh, I could probably wear the mask for hours uh, and hours without uh, getting it moist. So it's uh, good advice for the audience just to be aware of that. Yeah. And I might add that if you're going to be flying on a plane, then make sure you, maybe you have one extra. Depending upon how much action and engagement you've had, you may want to change it um, between flights. Uh, so just another consideration when you're getting ready to uh, um, travel again. 
Okay, I've got to ask you both this because I have dealt with this. I have talked to others who have dealt with it. I too wear glasses. How in the world do you wear the mask without fogging up your glasses? Is there a certain technique or is there a trick that you use? Because I know you've had to wear these masks in surgery for many hours, Dr. Gold. Sure. So I'd love to answer this question uh, because I do get asked <laughs> this question all the time. Most of the cloth masks and many of the cloth masks that are made uh, are just simply that, cloth or paper masks. However, some of the masks allow you to actually shape the top of the mask. So what I've done in this particular mask is I've put a piece of metal inside of foam, uh, which is uh, part taken from another mask, so that it has the shape, so that it bends and conforms to the top of my face. As a result of that, when you make it fit across the top of the bridge of your nose, most of the air that you exhale goes out the bottom of the mask and the sides of the mask, and it doesn't fog your glasses. Otherwise, it's almost impossible to see through your glasses, whether you wear prescription glasses or you're just wearing sunglasses uh, to take a walk or to drive in uh, on a warm summer afternoon. And so uh, there are all different types of masks that are available. And my recommendation is find one, and it can be disposable, it can be cloth, uh, that has this form-fitting uh, piece of foam metal inside of it that makes it more comfortable. Certainly all surgical masks have that because surgeons need that. In order, you know, you think about it, the last thing in the world you'd ever want to do if you're a surgeon is get fogged up and not be able to see what you're doing, right? <laughs> and so uh, if you want to do successful surgery, you need a form-fitting mask. And I might let make, make sure people know that Dr. Gold knows what he's talking about. He's been wearing masks as a surgeon for many, many years. 25 years, <laughs> yeah. A lot of masks over the years. <laughs> but there are some other trick, tricks out there. And in fact, they are commercial products that you can buy to actually um, uh, clean your glasses with that actually limit the amount of fogging that takes place on them. And one of the tricks is, is cleaning them and uh, uh, using soap. So in fact, that actually prevents or to, certainly uh, limits or reduces the amount of fogging that takes place. But again, there are commercial products that you can add in addition to the strategies that Dr. Gold mentioned to making sure that it's a tight fit above your nose. Okay, yeah, because the last thing we want is anybody to get hurt because they, their vision is impaired. And so we want to make sure that everybody's safe across the board at all levels. Christina from Louisiana is our next caller. Thanks for joining the conversation. Christina, go right ahead. Hey, good afternoon from the Great Bayou State. Um, I am a ICURN. I have been on the front lines, and I was recently um, diagnosed with COVID-19 on Friday. I currently do not have any symptoms whatsoever, thank God. And I am taking, um, I'm going to kind of go back a little bit. You were talking about treatments earlier. Um, I have been uh, prescribed the hydroxychloroquine and the z -Pack. Um I was a little nervous about taking that at first, you know, simply because I had seen the, the so long QT interval. However, I do not have any cardiac issues. And I wanted to kind of get your, your opinions on that, you know, as far as it decreasing the viral load to where I'm not as contagious. Um, I just want to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, Christina. So uh, there's a lot of literature, uh, both uh, scientific and non-scientific, about whether these drugs, these uh, chloroquine-like drugs, have any effect on either preventing or treating uh, COVID-19. One thing is for absolutely sure that in patients with cardiac disease or, or any what we call arrhythmias or irregularities of your heartbeat, you are at risk for what you had mentioned, uh, which is called prolonged QT syndrome, which can be actually a fatal complication of taking the drug. It is time-related and it is dosage-related, so we have to be extra careful about it. So we do not routinely prescribe these drugs, at least in our medical center. Uh, for individuals uh, who are minimally symptomatic or, or even severely symptomatic. Part of it is because we have access to remdesivir for the most symptomatic individuals. And in many individuals who are only mildly symptomatic, there's really no good scientific literature yet. Now, I will say this, Christina, that there are ongoing scientific studies across the country and around the world 
that are trying to definitively answer the question. But right now, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the question's still unanswered. And, uh, and I don't know, Dr. Henrik, so you, do you have any more information than that? Anything I've missed in my reading? Uh, really not. And I, what I heard you say, Christina, is that you may not have been terribly symptomatic. And in, in that situation, there's really no reason to push uh, your health or push your heart by adding additional medications. So, um, of course, I'm assuming that you've been working with a physician who's examining you and, and made a determination that it was important or helpful to you, uh, in which case they know much more than we do. But as uh, Dr. Gold has mentioned, in general, we do not prescribe those medications. Okay, but thank you for calling and sharing that with us, just the bravery alone. We really appreciate you calling in the show, Christina. Thank you for that. All right, our next question comes from Mark in Minnesota. Let's listen. Is the virus, the coronavirus, natural or man-made? And how many people that had flu shots last in the last season uh, ended up with corona? as we see the big spike in nursing homes in Minnesota. Yeah, Mark, uh, so, you know, hopefully we'll definitively answer your question in the future, but right now <clears throat> people think, I am led to believe, but only because of what I read and hear people say, that this is a naturally occurring virus uh, that came from a cave uh, in central China spread through the wet food markets of China, and then from uh, mutated from being resident in bats to uh, ultimately uh, to be able to infect human beings. And, uh, and there's all kinds of conspiracy theories about whether these came out of a laboratory in China or elsewhere, whether or not they're man-made or naturally occurring. But uh, <clears throat> let's for a moment just accept what most people think uh, and that is that it's a naturally uh, occurring uh, virus. As far as the uh, impact of uh, influenza vaccine, you know, most individuals in long-term care facilities, senior citizen facilities, et cetera, do get flu shots. And indeed, that has been just about the most vulnerable population due to their age and comorbidity. So there's really no reason to think that the immunity that's conferred by influenza vaccine uh, does anything specific, underscore the word specific, for COVID-19. Now, whether a heightened immune capability due to the flu shot or actually, uh, for that matter, due to any vaccine, such as even small box vaccine or measles vaccine, et cetera, creates a more immunologically capable host, uh, I don't know the answer to that. Dr. Hendricks, do you have any thoughts on that question? Because there's been a good deal written recently on that. Yeah, well, let's start uh, back with your question, Mark. And you aren't the only one asking that. A lot of people are asking that question of where did this virus come from? And all I can do is share with you the science that we have uh, and, and the evidence in our own laboratory. And the evidence is that we've obtained the genetic information or the code of this virus and compared it to other viruses, in particular the viruses, coronaviruses from bats. And this virus is more closely related to the coronavirus from bats that, have, that existed uh, prior to 2019 than it is even closest to its nearest neighbor, which is SARS-1. So that's the reason why we believe it actually did originate in a bat population. Um, so, but that's a very important issue and one that uh, we're glad you're asking about. Yeah. Judy in Montana is next, and she says, even though we've had no cases of the virus yet, our local medical clinic is gearing up with equipment as though an outbreak is undoubtedly coming. Do they know something we don't? Well, you know, uh, I don't think they know anything for sure, Judy, but, uh, you know, as one of our national leaders once uh, uh, recently said, is that the virus in, in this country and around the world spreads like a wildfire. And, and what they meant by that is that it can start off as a small area and it sort of becomes like a tinderbox in a long-term care facility, in a meatpacking plant, in the congregation of a church or a choir or an athletic team. And then just like the wind can carry uh, the fires from one community to another, all it takes is one individual to get in the car or get in an airplane and move from one community to another, and all of a sudden that virus has spread 
just like the wind can take a fire from one community from one side of the street uh, to the other. So I think, Judy, what your community is saying is that while we don't know for sure, the only thing that is guaranteed <clears throat> is that the members of your community are not immune because this is a new virus that you and your colleagues, your friends, your family, uh, people in your church uh, have not seen before. And therefore, wisely, they want to be ready. And I think that's the message. I think they also want to be ready for when vaccines become available as to how they're going to deploy those vaccines because that's going to take some planning as well of the public health groups, of your physicians, of your you know, physician practices, hospitals and clinics, et cetera, as to who gets the vaccine when and how to most efficiently deploy it. Because even though there's hopefully going to be a lot of it available, it isn't all going to be available on day one. And we're going to have to figure out who goes first, who goes second, you know, who goes last, unfortunately. You said that day one, when we actually do have a viable vaccine, that could be coming sooner than later. Realistically, when is the soonest that you believe that we will have a, a successful vaccine that has been approved in this country? Well, you know, there are a number, there are three different uh, manufacturers that are currently in efficacy trials. That is to say, they've already been through safety trials. And so uh, that means that they're looking for thousands of individuals uh, to immunize that will give them some preliminary information. Typically, these trials take years, but at the current way this is being scaled, I was, I'm guessing, you know, four months, six months. Steve, do you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, the only other thought I'd have is that uh, in your community, there may well be a medical center or entity that is actually testing the vaccine now. Yeah, like what we're going to do, right? Exactly right. Mm -hmm. So pay attention and uh, by all means, volunteer if one uh, becomes available. We'd very much like you to participate. That's going to be important for the country. Absolutely. Absolutely. What, a, what an interesting time. So grateful for the partnership that we have with UNMC. It's just been such a blessing for all of us here in rural America. As we go into Independence Day, we don't have a lot of time, Dr. Gold, but I just wondered if you had some words for our viewers just to reinforce before another big holiday. Yeah, you know, uh, the responsibility is on each of us, uh, and particularly as we go into this holiday. Uh, the things around social distancing, uh, wearing personal protective equipment, being sure we have more than enough masks going into the holiday, uh, making sure we sanitize and wash our hands and surfaces, and that we're very conscious that if we're ill, feeling ill, if we're with somebody who's ill, that we stay home, that we call our medical professional, and we take all those precautions. It's not just your health and wellness, but it's about all of those that we love and we trust in our communities that depend upon us being socially responsible. So this is a really good time to remember that it's on you and I. That's right. And uh, protecting our neighbors is so important. So we got to wear those masks. Thank you all for joining us so much tonight. UNMC Chancellor Dr. Jeffrey Gold, Chief of Pathology and Microbiology at UNMC, Dr. Steve Henricks, really appreciate you joining us. Always looking forward to the next guest that you're going to bring us, Dr. Gold, because you always bring us such wonderful guests. Thank you, Dr. Henrik. You're just a wealth of information for us tonight. All right, stay with us. Coming up at 8 Eastern during Rural America Live, you're going to meet 25 years of champions at the World Livestock Auctioneer Championship, plus important industry discussion, 8 Eastern, 7 Central, right here on RFD TV. Wishing you and your family a beautifully blessed evening. Hope you stay safe and we'll see you back here next week.